a bit of an intro and they can, it's not too important, so they can, they can uh, just get in when the exciting stuff happens. So, hi everyone, how's everyone doing? Oh, come on, it's happening so late. How's everyone doing? Garden. Yeah, uh, we'll be your host tonight. This is actually a bit of a rehash on the panel we've been giving on the East Coast because we were both uh, educated on the East Coast, um, at Oda Cobb and those kinds of places. Um, so it's really exciting to be in this panel on the West Coast. Um, so just just a bit about ourselves. Uh, my name's Joe. Um, I actually got I actually got my BA in Physics and Math at Harvard in 2011, and right now I'm doing my PhD at Stanford, um, mainly focusing on X-ray physics. Uh, so, I, I also do a lot of panels, so I'm also the guy doing the Japanese panel tomorrow, um, Japanese anime edition. I, I don't know how the names ended up exactly the same as this one, but maybe that's just how it really works. Uh, so, if, you, if you're interested in learning that, please come to that one too. Yeah, my name's uh, Dark, uh, I, uh, I guess I also have a graduate student this, and I'm um, also a graduate student right now, so excited to solve around. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> Alright, so the first question we're going to ask is how high do they fly? So we kind of really don't know where the camera's placed or a lot of uh, those details, but we can just kind of say that they you know, flew in the air a few body lengths. And I really want to give it to them, they can have it. You know, like pretty much if any of you have speed run the game, you know, like grenade jumping is totally possible. Sorry. <laughs> So then, what we then look is that we can actually sort of tell how far away they are by uh, their size on screen. And we do this using an equation. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, the, the idea is that objects farther away will basically be smaller, right? And this, this is seen from the uh, magnification equation, which basically just says at longer distances. Charging, there's current pulling through everything. 
And it turns out the sign of this force is exactly what you would expect. It's out, it's out of the rails. It's what it gives this this projectile force to proceed down the rails and shoot out the end of the rail gun. Um, so that's really just a little bit of exposition. This is how a rail gun works. It's a current that goes through some that goes through a bunch of rails, and then there's a projectile that feels a force and it gets expelled from the rails. Now, um, back to what uh, Misawa actually did in this clip. So first of all, what is Fleming's momentum? Um, it's absolutely nothing. I don't know where the writers of the show like came up with this idea. Um, they could have asked anybody with like high school physics, and they would have told them that maybe okay, maybe it sounds cool. Alexander Fleming like discovered penicillin. I have no idea what he had. <laughs> absolutely nothing. So this is this is just complete like fabrication. Um, so. I just wanted to poke fun at that for a little bit, but yeah, okay, um, So, but now we, I actually want to ask ourselves, what is the power that is actually necessary to create a railgun in mid air? Um, so the first thing we have to do is we have to find out, remember because a railgun depends on current flowing over wire, what is the current in this railgun? Um, so we estimate the length of the railgun, it's, we'll just give it to it, it's about arm's length, let's say it's about uh, half a meter, right? So this is, the, this is the length that the current has to travel up and down. The uh, rail valve circuit. Um, so I'm not going to go through this calculation. You can ignore the equation. Um, so if you assume that the coin is around 5.67 grams, um, and it must be accelerated to around, let's say, a thousand meters per second, you know, you have to pretty much break the sound barrier here. How much force do you need? And the force you need, if you do the do the calculation, the equation is given to you is around 5,670 newtons. Um, this is around 500 pounds of force. Uh, Okay, so once again, more equations, feel free to ignore, but there's actually a simple way to figure out what the force, um, what the magnetic field curling around the wire is. Um, and from that, because the more current you send through a wire, the more magnetic field is there, by this calculation you can actually get out an estimate of how much current is going in the real time. So if you plug in a force value of 5,600 newtons, and then you plug in a bunch of different co uh, constants and a different, a bunch of different um, estimates that we have of like what the what the rail sizes are, you get the current is 0.2 megahertz, um, which is 200,000 amps. Uh, just to put this in perspective, in my research, like a, a current of like 10 milliamps, 0.01 amps, tends to blow shit up. So <laughs> this is. 200,000 amps. This is like way more, this is like six orders of magnitude, seven orders of magnitude above um, what's actually currently used in practice in a lot of applications. So um, we now have a current. So now it's actually simple matter to find power dissipated by the system because we have a current and we can figure out, it's going through midair and we can figure out what exactly is the power needed to maintain the current. So I want to emphasize that Air is an awful, awful conductor. You cannot send a current through mid air. This is why, like, if you if you like take a fork and you put it arbitrarily close to like power stock, don't do this. By the way, um, you you can get it pretty. You can get it like as close as you want as long as you don't physically touch the internal circuitry and you won't get shot. There is nothing that will allow the current to jump from the internal circuit to your fork because air is just such a poor conductor. So. That is actually what's going to show up in this equation. So the power dissipated is a function of what's called the resistivity. The resistivity is basically a function of how poor of a conductor you are. The more resistive you are, the harder it is for current to flow. And for air, the resistivity is 1.3 times 10 to the 16 ohm meters. And that is a huge number. Uh, so if you go through everything, you get the power dissipated by the current in air is 2.07 times 10 to the 24 watts. So, um, just as a bit of comparison, um, one horsepower is around 745. <laughs> so, the maximum power output of an 18 wheeler is about 4.5 times 10 to the 5 watts. We're still missing around 19 orders of magnitude here. Damn. Uh, the average consumption of an airplane is around 10 to 8 watts. Jesus. The average total power consumption of the <laughs> God damn. <laughs> it's around 10 to the 12 watts. The total power of the <laughs> <laughs> And we didn't, I mean, we didn't continue playing this 
game, like, we can push this. The power of the most powerful nuclear bomb ever detonated is around 10 to the 24 watts. So basically, um, basically we solved the end of the crisis. <laughs> uh, so actually, it, it's totally cool. So you can just continue doing this, but you can just like, you know, live in the like nuclear power button and just like, like just do one day of that, and then we'll be fine for like decades. So, uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, though, if you, if you actually think about this, the, the order of magnitude it is a bit too off. This is this is completely unlikely. Um, if you're just doing this through midair. So unfortunately, this is also busted. <laughs>
I will, I will put a disclaimer. This is part of the panel that got a little cut because Dropbox did not sync. So we're just going to have to do without slides for a little bit. Um, so just, just bear with us. Yeah. So I'm flying blind here, guys. So this might suck a lot. <laughs> anyway. All right. So what generally happened was that there was like uh, the guy named Oxygen disappear. But then what the, uh, the opponent did was that she said air. And that basically made all of oxygen, which is about 78% nitrogen, 21% uh, oxygen, and 1% argon. Um, what happened was that now the nitrogen and the oxygen, uh, and the argon is back, but the oxygen disappeared. Or sorry, it's the other way around. The, yeah, it's the other way around. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, so basically what's, uh, what's there is now 100% oxygen, right? Uh, but generally, 100% oxygen, like they're saying, is poisonous and stuff, and yeah, there is indeed oxygen poison. But, in all honesty, at a low pressure, it's actually pretty awesome. You get kind of high. Um, <laughs> and then what about the circular breathing stuff, right? So what ends up happening is that if any of you guys have ever like breathed into like, you know, a paper bag or something, that sort of circular breathing, you're basically breathing out something, and what you're exhaling is actually still 78% nitrogen. I believe about 16% uh, oxygen, 5% uh, carbon dioxide, and probably 1% uh, argon still. So what you're doing is you're just constantly breathing that back in, using up all the oxygen, and putting out more and more carbon dioxide. Which then, like, you're gonna start feeling like uh, lightheaded, but like not in a high way, but in like a, you just ran a lot, which doesn't feel good way. And you're gonna, uh, it's, so it's, it's, but that's also really bad, and your heart rate's gonna go up, and you're generally gonna feel like shit. So what's that? Uh, so yeah. So if you had a choice between that and getting high off low pressure oxygen, like that's a pretty clear choice. <laughs> so yeah. The other thing I wanted to just point out is that like they got rid of the atmosphere, and you know like they're gonna explode and stuff, right? And to undo the exploding, they're gonna try to breathe out all of their air. But that is like literally impossible because <laughs> at some point like air gets stuck in your lungs. You can never get rid of all the air in your lungs unless you literally take out your lungs from your body and press them out. <laughs> and the reason for this is that when you breathe out, you're actually increasing the pressure around your lungs. But that's sort of like, if you imagine your lungs as a balloon, right? When you increase the pressure around your balloon, uh, around the balloon, like air comes out. But the way the lung works is that it also increases the pressure around the uh, branches going into like the bags of air in your lungs. So at some point, like, if you imagine with the balloon, you're going to put pressure on it, but you'll also put pressure on, like, the neck of the balloon. So at some point, you're working against yourself, and air will be trapped inside you. So, yeah. And then just one final thing. This is in all the sci-fi movies and stuff like that. You do not explode in space. It's actually way less fun. You just get bloated. So what ends up happening is that, like, at supremely low pressure points, like, your blood, which is basically water, is going to start boiling. Okay, and then like all the uh, like you'll get air bubbles all over your uh, water bubbles, like or bubbles all over your blood, and then you'll just get really bloated. So it's not really like boom boom exploding, but just like. <laughs> <laughs> Post disclaimer: Darwin is a part-time med student, so this is like the non-physics part of it. Oh wait, uh, yeah, what's up, bro? Question: uh, If that were to happen, I'm gonna ask this, but do you poop your pants? <laughs> Do you poop your pants <laughs> if you're in space without a spacesuit? Is that am I understanding the question? Right? <laughs> um, so eventually, yes, because once you die, like you don't have your sphincter muscles anymore, and you just. <laughs> uh, um, let's see. I don't think it's as dramatic. Uh... Yeah. Well, okay. Okay. Yeah. That that is also very much. Anyway. Um, so <laughs> That, right? No, that would be de what I just explained was death. But what? So. <laughs> 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 so yeah. Um. Like. Okay. So there's actually some interesting things about like what happens when you're in space, and we can talk more about this after the panel. But the idea is that like you're pushing everything to the limit. Because even if like you know the coldest freezer you've ever been in, it's, it's cold, right? But space is literally the definition of as cold as it can get because there's nothing there, which is the definition of zero Kelvin of the like coldest possible temperature. Same thing for pressure. There's literally no pressure because there's nothing there, and that basically messes with a whole bunch of stuff. So um, like. 
if you pooped your pants, that would definitely be the least of your concerns. <laughs> Alright, so, so so that's it for this one, right? Like, there's nothing else that happens in this episode. Like, no, I, I mean, we're not letting this get away. Like, there's, there's definitely something part of this, so. Um, 
And if that were to collapse, um, then you see the you see here plot on the y-axis what the radius of uh, the resultant white dwarf would be because of this degeneracy pressure pushed back. Now, um, up to a certain limit, you have a finite radius. So up until this limit, where you have this dotted line here, the white dwarf can exist. It exists because of this degeneracy pressure. But after this, you have a supernova. But I want you to notice something that the point at which you actually get this transition to what when you get a supernova is around 1.4 solar masses. So you have to have a planet that's around 1.4 times the mass of the sun. If you actually look at the pictures, I mean, they pretty much model it around the size of the Earth. And unless that thing was made of, like, unobtainium, I have no idea how it would be, like, 1.5 solar masses thick, right? So, uh, I'm going to stop this animation is too distracting. Uh, so it's actually very unlikely unfortunately, that um, the supernova would have happened in No Game No Life just because of quantum mechanical effects. Um, so actually the game should have ended in a tie because, yeah, nothing, nothing of a sort of a huge explosion should have happened. So, yeah, this unfortunately is not possible, so we're going to count this as, oh, sorry, yeah. so we're going to count this as So yeah, the way these things like generally go is that like a bunch of physicists meet together in a physics meeting, and physics is physics, and no physics physicists. So that is our physics. <laughs> so yeah. And yep. So generally, what we do in physics is like 90% of it is kind of called fuck each other. So we have an equation, we have some numbers, and we just plug it all. So yeah, when we look at this equation. We basically have the radius of our black hole, which is a seven and a half meters. Uh, yeah, we have the mass, which is what we're generally solving for, and we have a bunch of other stuff. So, what we're gonna do is once we like, you know, plug it all in and like solve it, we get a mass of five times like 10 to the 27 kilograms. That's like nine or 800 like Earths. That's a lot of stuff. So if you think about it, like, uh, I don't know if the red mech had like multiple like, Loads of that, but he needs to carry like 800 Earths for every like black hole attack he wants to do. That's a uh, that's a lot of prep time, man. All right. So generally, uh, yeah, when we uh, look at the conclusion.
してゼリー状になるこれまでのデータから推測するにセレンはカーブラックホールを使ってタイムトラベルの技術を開発しているだとすると10のマイナス24乗金の質量を10のマイナス19乗メートルのところに押し込んで過去に送るわけこの穴にこのスポンジを通そうとするようなものよだから中身はスカスカになるつまりすごく狭いってことそうすごく狭いところに無理やり押し込んでこの説明は多すぎだろ上皇<笑><笑><笑><笑>
his clock is the same speed. So um, at 12.10, he stopped on his trip because his trip um, only took, uh, oh sorry, at 12.10, yeah, there's, there's um, I look out my window and of course because outside his, his trip is taking a long time, I only see an empty lawn outside. However, if I look through the wormhole because our clocks were synced through the wormhole, um, he's already returned from his trip through the wormhole. So through the wormhole, he's returned from the outside perspective, he hasn't. So what this basically says um, is if I let go of my friend's hand now and I go on living for 10 years, then I can actually see um, him return from his normal time of 10 years through the trip. And now this wormhole um, is a path through time to the earlier me who was holding his hand through the wormhole. So I know I went through that really fast because we're running out of time, but the idea is you can, in principle, have thought experience like this if you have certain elements necessary, you can create a passage through time um, that acts as a time machine. That's a time machine. So, um, yeah, we can, we can assume that given an infinitely advanced civilization, um, last slide, we can assume that given an infinitely advanced civilization, you can think of things like time machine actually existing. Um, and currently, of course, we're, these things are not realizable because our, our physics research is not there, but you could think like you could totally dream, and that's why sci-fi things are there, um, that things like this might one day be possible. So um, we'll actually call this one plausible. And then we have yeah. <laughs> 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 I think we've got a super pissed off the admin.